Welcome to Can I Get a Retake, where we explore the accomplishments of our innovative community. Each month, we speak with one of Great River Learning's higher ed instructors and authors. Together, we discuss trends in education, areas of study, and a variety of teaching styles and philosophies. My name is Michaela, your marketing coordinator. My name is Michelle, your web design supervisor. And this is Great River Learning's Can Can I I Get get a a Retake? We are here today with Michelle Stanley. Michelle is a professor of music and flute at Colorado State University. She is also the director of the Arts Management Program, as well as chair of the music department in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance at CSU. Michelle is also a flutist, not a flautist. Stick around for that conversation later. And she has performed throughout the United States, as well as internationally. Countries include Russia, Japan, China, France, the UK, Italy, Germany, Austria, Slovakia, and Hungary. She is principal flute for the Pro Musica Chamber Orchestra and the Colorado Bach Ensemble. She also performs with Quattro Duo, a flute and guitar duo with her husband, Jeff LaQuattro. She can be heard on the Navona and Centaur labels through all of the regular streaming channels. Finally, and most importantly, but we're biased... Michelle is the author of Music Appreciation, Successful Listening in All Music, an online text and course materials published by Great River Learning. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and like how you got to where you are today, like being the chair of the department and all of that? Yeah, well, this is my 16th year at Colorado State and for Collins, and it's such an interesting thing. And when I started here in 06, I was an adjunct professor. And I was, you know, teaching at other universities to scrape by. And and here I am now, full professor chair of the department. So um, what a difference 16 years makes, right? So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I started off as, as a faculty member teaching flute, but I also taught some classes that would fill out my load a little bit. And one of those classes was music appreciation. And that was a really, um, I had done it before at other universities, so I was very experienced and it was a really good thing for me to add to my teaching load and I was really, really happy uh, getting back in the classroom here at this university to do that particular class. So uh, in amongst other classes too. So over the time, um, then the the position of the flute professor was uh, moved into a tenure track position. At that point, I, of course, I applied for it, got the position, because I had been the interim where I had been the adjunct for many years and, and then um, was on the tenure track. So I stopped teaching the music appreciation class around that time, which freed me up to, to do more flute related uh, activities for my tenure. And then in 2018, I was approached by my Dean to help take over a program um, that had been kind of fledgling. It was an arts management program of which I had a hand in starting many years ago and so I've been doing that since 2018. And I, because of my experience in administration that way, then again, the Dean came to me five years later and said, would you be the chair of the music department? Um, I'm still doing all the jobs. So I'm not apparently very yeah. good at negotiating my <laughs> workload. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I should listen to myself and, and think that through. So if anyone's listening to this, make sure you renegotiate your workload. <laughs> but I actually really enjoy everything I'm doing. It's been really fun. So and it, it's been great to be on this side of the of academia to see what it's like to be an administrator. And I, I really enjoy it. It's great fun. New problems yeah. to solve. Right. That's a lot of different hats. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been asked, can I get a retake? <laughs> oh, I'm sure back in those days <laughs> back, when I was teaching. But yeah. remember that was a long time ago. Yeah, I probably yeah. stopped teaching music appreciation in probably 2010. So it's, it's yeah. been quite a long time. <laughs> and, you know, because what, why, I guess it always depends on why they wanted that retake. So yeah. 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 If they were, if they wanted to retake because they literally missed the exam because they were in the hospital sure <laughs> yeah um, if they want to take a retake because they didn't get a good grade the answer mm-hmm. would be no <laughs> that's a different thing <laughs> yeah absolutely. that's a different thing <laughs> one thing that we had listed to, to talk to you about really is your experience in music performance not only domestically but internationally can you tell us a little bit about that as well 
Yeah, I'm so lucky. You know, what a great career that I've been able to have as a flutist, you know, and I, I can't believe I just thank my lucky stars that um, people pay me to play the flute, which is crazy, <laughs> totally crazy. So um, yeah, I've had great fortune to play nationally, but for some reason I've had really great luck with international performances. So uh, I just took advantage of opportunities when they came. And it's so funny if I think about every single one of those opportunities, they were just like, it's, you know, people you know and networks you've made over your lifetime. And, oh, hey, we're going to Russia. Would you like to play in St. Petersburg with us? Um, yes, I would. Uh, or my record company said, hey, we want to partner with the Chinese government and bring classical music to um, people who've never heard Western classical music. Would you like to go on a two work tour of China? Yes, I would. So that um, that was uh, in October of 2019, I will mention. So maybe the timing was really interesting. Um, and then, you know, just it's been interesting to be able to go to some countries where I was able to finagle some concerts, you know, oh, we have this one concert in Scotland. So, and then I have a family member who's living in the South of France for the summer. Let's put together a program there. So um, I was able to do all these amazing trips, um, some with the university. Uh, definitely, I was in China with the university as a grad student, but here at CSU, we went to uh, Austria, Hungary, Slovakia, and Germany that was two weeks of great fun. So yeah, it's, it's extraordinary, actually. People ask me how that came to be, but you can see it's just from all these different channels. And I think when you work at a university, you definitely have those opportunities given to you, which is really fun. That is. And I guess my follow up question was, what advice would you have to performers who want to follow in your footsteps, but you really oh. do that as well? Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, again, if you're working at a university, you do have a lot of channels that you can um, rely on and the networks that you've created. But I'd also say, you know, create your own opportunities too. Don't be afraid to take advantage of something. So just as an example, um, somebody reached out to me a bunch of years ago and they run a summer camp for musicians in Italy and then also in Germany, another session. And they said, do you wanna be on our faculty? And I thought, okay, well, tell me what this is about. And, and it was a little, I was a little concerned at first because you have to bring your own students or you at least have to recruit your own students. And I was a little concerned, like, could I do that? Would it financially make sense? And I thought, well, what the heck, let's just give this a shot. So um, I jumped in with both feet and I was able to bring students. So, you know, to other folks who are thinking, oh, I could never teach at a festival in Europe. If someone approaches you and it, it seems a little tricky, I'd say, just give it a shot, give it a try. But also people want to listen to classical music all over the world. So you can put together your own concerts. You can reach out to a church. You could, you know, do your research and see what's around and offer, you know, to have a performance because sometimes you can get funding from your institution to get the flights covered and the lodging. And then, you know, if you don't mind not getting paid very much or just <laughs> a little bit, that can work really great. So um, yeah, just uh, rely on your networks and, and try to say yes a lot. Yeah. Did you start playing the flute then when you were really young? I mean, that typical fifth grade, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. fifth grader and band and they have instrument night and you pick out your instruments. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was like, oh, I'll play the drums because all the boys were back there. And then <laughs> that I realized that was really dumb. And so then I was like, I'll play the trumpet because there's three buttons because that's the fifth grade logic in my yeah. brain. And then I w settled on oboe because I thought, well, there's not a lot of oboe players, which I should have stuck with oboe because mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of oboe players and they pay a lot of money to get mm -hmm. you to go to school. And then for some reason, flute just, I don't know, I kept landing on the flute. Um, I had actually a little recorder from the fourth grade and I took a piece of tape and covered like the end of it and then used it as a little flute oh, so <laughs> so I just I, I knew I wanted to play the flute and I got really good really fast um surpassing one of the little girls in, in my band who had been taking lessons a, a year before me and I really liked it and mm -hmm. I can't believe it turned into the life I have now so from my 
upbringing in Maine, which, you know, rural Maine is not a hotbed of culture, but we had band programs and I took mm-hmm. advantage and my parents were very supportive of doing that, but I am the only musician in my family. But people make a really good living in music all the time, all the time. I mean, yeah. you, you look at the musicians who played in the Grammys last night that happened to be broadcast oh. last night um, to the people who put together those performances to, I mean, there's so many careers in music and it's not just the typical route that folks think of. So, I mean, even textbook publishing, like who would have thought that at one point in my life I would write a textbook I, and there's income attached to that. So it's a shame that we're still in that dialogue of like, you have to have something else in order to make a living. Yeah. However, I, you know, I'm here to wave the banner you yeah. know, of, of be a musician. It's a great life. But you, you did mention when it, it, writing the textbook, mm-hmm. that was something you hadn't expected to do. How did all of these personal experiments, experiences culminate in you writing this uh, music appreciation text? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just, I, it's so random, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I was teaching for a long time. I was teaching the a music appreciation class in another university, as I mentioned. And then when I was employed by CSU, they had me teaching a class, of course. And you know, the world of textbooks, you have people knocking on your doors and asking you, have you ever considered writing your own? And Mm -hmm. that happened. And it would happen to be a Great River Learning um, Acquisitions Manager. And I think I pushed him off multiple times because, (laughs) I mean, I was an adjunct professor and who was I to do anything like that? And I, I wasn't responsible for making any decisions about anything. And certainly wasn't thinking that I had the capability of, of doing that. But, you know, look, I have a doctorate. I know how to write. Um, and they were folks who were willing to help me. So once he, he kind of wore me down. Um, <laughs> but I and I I'm very famous for saying that it's the stupidest thing I've ever done and the most intelligent thing I've ever done, because it was really hard to do. You know, it was something I'd never done before, never considered doing. So making the time to create the textbook was at, way back when. Um, was a challenge, but um, the rewards on the other side have been just fantastic. You know, being able to completely redesign the music appreciation classes here for CSU. We went from a couple of classes of 70 students to well over 2,100 students a year. I mean, we offer so many sections of this class. They're very popular because of the vision of having taught the class and knowing you know, the things I didn't like in the, in the other books that were offered and the things that I dreamt about being able to do. And that has made, uh, that made the process really fun and interesting. So that's how I came to it. So somebody wore me down. That's really <laughs> <laughs> We hear that so often though, yeah. from adjuncts. <clears throat> They're like, who, who am I to, to take this step? But you're right. So they are more than prepared. But you're probably for, the most qualified. The most qualified. <laughs> right, you're right. To do something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're right. I mean, we, the <laughs> adjuncts are the heart and soul of every university. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying the tenure track faculty or tenured faculty are not, but tenured and tenure track faculty are responsible for doing, you know, furthering their research. And adjunct faculty are here to teach. They are the specialists of teaching. So um, you're right. They're the ones, the, the mm-hmm. right ones to do this job. So you mentioned that there were some things that you didn't like about what you had been using. Can you tell us more about, you know, what you changed in your publication? Sure, of course. I was looking, um, you know, in my dream mind of of what I would love in a book was a book that covered all music, all musical genres. And there were some out there, not very many. So most textbooks at that time, I mean, we're, again, we're talking, this was like, 2000 and um, maybe seven, six, something like that. Well, yeah, seven or eight. Um, They were really focused on Western classical music. And I taught out of those for a long time and they were just great. You know, I certainly could talk about classical music all day long, but I definitely recognized that the students wanted to learn other things. And I had a realization that, that the success of the student could also be hinged on them learning to listen to their own music a little bit better. So learning to listen in. So to to play heavy metal music and and mm-hmm. get them to think about the musical elements, get them to consider the context in which it was written and 
um, it just made sense to offer the class to be all genres, all genres of music. So this particular text um, covers the musical elements, it covers classical music, and then it moves into what I call um, cultural music. So instead of world music, I like to, that's just a term that I felt was a little bit more appropriate because it really connects with the culture and societies of uh, where the music is coming from. Um, jazz, and then the last section is popular music. And it's hard to get through everything, but if you're working through teaching your students how to listen in and listen a little bit better, you can cover a lot of ground um, with that topic in mind. So, and, and helping the students to appreciate different kinds of music. They may not like country music, but the time they spend listening to it, again, they can come away with a deeper understanding and a better appreciation. Sure. What would you say are some of the life lessons you want to impart on those students? Well, you know, it's, I hope that they can walk away from the class feeling like they've found a new artist that they've never discovered before. I don't, you know, I'm, there's no interest in converting them to classical music lovers, but any, any new artist that they never heard before, how amazing would that be? Or how amazing would it be for those students to leave there with the lesson of, I really love music and I wanna experience it more in my life. So going to live concerts. A lot of students don't necessarily have that. They didn't do it as a family or um, gosh, I mean, if I could get five students out of 250 to go to a classical music concert on their own volition, I would be thrilled. Um, <laughs> but if they just go to anything, they're mm -hmm. supporting the arts and mm -hmm. they become a patron. So. Um, though that might be my goal, I think what I want them to take away is that lifelong love of music, which most, I, I can't say all people have, but it's a common, mm -hmm. it's a common love depending on, you know, the genre, of course. Yeah. Do you feel like writing and creating the book um, has like changed your perspective of music education at all? Well, sure. I think so. You know, I, as a flutist, I mean, I'd gone to school and gotten all the silly degrees for, for flute, but then suddenly I'm standing in front of 250 students. So I do think it, it changed my perception of the experience of a, of a general college student, which was really good for me, you know, and I think it helped me as an administrator later on, because I, I see the, the broader population rather than, you know, the one-on-one -on -one, um, experience with a, with a flute player. Like, I spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with my flute students, but that's not the reality of campus. So I, I, that gave me a really good perspective of what st student success look like. And I'm, that is a real focus. Um, what does student success look like in the classroom? What does it look like as for the content of the book, the assessments that we give them, the conversations that we have. So I hope, you know, I hope yeah. that, that comes through in the classes when I did teach, you know, I, I'm not teaching those classes anymore, but. Right. Know. Does student success look any differently now post COVID than it did? Ah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's different. It feels different. It looks different. It smells different. I, everything is different. I mean, it's an incredibly unique experience. And I, I will say this, um, you know, this is a podcast, but I'm not um, fresh out of school anymore. So I, I've seen a lot of students in my life, my, my lifetime, and they're very different. Um, so what does student success look like on the other side of COVID? I think it has made every single faculty member recognize that students are different now. Their mental health is very front and center and that we have to pay attention to that. We have to be um, compassionate and kind and empathetic. We have to hold our standards, but they, the students are requiring of us to be aware that these things are important to them. And these students are very different. They had a you know, very different experience in um, their high school. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, mental health has been a big change. We also have to be careful now about not teaching it the way we did when it was just online. So when we pivoted to an online format, mm -hmm. um, we definitely did things very differently. We, we gave them the content in a really unique way. And um, 
now we have to not do that. We have to be very careful about not doing that because it's, it is a face-to-face -face situation. So um, offering the content in class as opposed to always having everything digitally online. Sure. But I mean, it's still, it's still really morphing. Like we're still really figuring that out. Mm -hmm. So the, your question's a really good one. And I can tell you that it's really different, but I can tell you we're still trying to figure it out. I yeah. mean, gosh, with AI coming through, I, I think yeah. everything's about to change. Um, are you offering any, I mean, like what are you and your instructors doing to assist the students? Um, are you offering any, I mean, like what are you and your instructors doing to assist the students nowadays if we get back on topic to like a mm, post-COVID situation, you know, what, how has your department changed because the students have changed? Um, you know, again, I, I'll say it's, we're still in the newness of it. So I, I'm not sure I have a, a, a great <laughs> answer, but I, I know that we talk about it a lot from um, the perspective of mental health, for mm -hmm. sure, being able to help students when they struggle, um, being able to be lenient yet and kind and empathetic and compassionate, but um, still keep some standards. Mm -hmm. And there are departments on campus that help us with that. The resources um, for disabled students gives us a lot of resources for that. Um, otherwise, the, some of the other things we're noticing, we've noticed quite a bit of problem with um, attendance actually. So students are not going to class, like they're physically not showing up. So there's been a lot of discussion, um, even with my own husband in the class that he teaches about creating in-class events, experiences, you know, discussions that happen to keep students coming back to the classroom so that there's incentive to be showing up yeah. and that it's not just delivering content through a lecture but it's delivering content through interaction and engagement so that's been a really big thing that i've seen um, a lot of pivoting with the students from who've gone through covid because their attention spans are a little bit different now um, they're not used to sitting in a classroom and, and watching a, an instructor uh, lecture. So we just need to find better ways of, of delivering content. That's what Great River is all about. <laughs> <laughs> Little plug. Just throwing that in there. <laughs> but I think it's to a great extent. Well, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how the revisions that you're gonna be doing will look. So uh, you're gearing up to revise your online publication. And so can you tell us a little bit about what you're planning to add or change and all of that? Yeah, I'm mean, really excited about this. Um, my plan uh, for the revisions, and there's always revisions going, right? It's like uh -huh. you, you're constantly updating, which is so great to have a digital textbook like that, just to plug that, because it really, it's so nimble. Yeah. Um, but what I'm really, reflecting on is issues of representation. And I feel that my textbook, because it covers the gamut of, of the art form of music, we do touch on, uh, we do of course discuss composers uh, who are from minoritized populations, but it's not enough. And we can do, I can do a better job in the classical music section to discuss women composers and performers. and. Uh, and use that platform to discuss the why. Why was it like this? Why were women composers not accepted or you know, brought into the fold? Why were uh, African-American composers not being seen as valid uh, mm -hmm. in the time frame that they were writing? And we, there were incredible composers that were existing and, and the output of music was extraordinary and beautiful and incredible. And it doesn't make the history books and it needs to make my book. So mm -hmm. that's going to change. Um, certainly we're, there's gonna be a lot of revisions in the classical music section to include that. But then I'd like to really use that, this platform of the book to talk about the, again, the issues of why. Why did, um, we had all these incredible musicians in the jazz era and the genre. And this is the place where integration began in this country. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be discussed better. Um, really celebrating uh, those composers, but also the work they did to fight for civil rights. Mm -hmm. Certainly we'll, we'll be continuing that conversation in popular music and, and it's already addressed where the representation is there, but not the discussion of the why. Mm -hmm. um, cultural music is interesting because of course we're already 
talking about all these co countries and the, the global nature of music. Uh, so that one probably won't change a lot, but it's certainly enough to um, to tie into the rest of the book. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm uh, hopeful that that can get done um, relatively soon. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited too. I mean, it's, I think I feel like I should have done this before. So it's um, later than, than we should have, and it shouldn't have taken a, a national reckoning to get to this place. But um, we're here now and it's time mm -hmm. to fix it. So that's the plan moving mm -hmm. forward for the book. Sure, better late than never. <laughs> I hope so. I'm excited to help work on parts of the design element for it. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. Great, I'm really glad. <laughs> wow. You and your husband are in a duo together, aren't you? We are, we have a flute and guitar duo. That's absolutely right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So plug that as well, maybe. Thank you. That's so nice. Yeah, it's called Quattro Duo, and um, you know, we 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 were silent there during that pandemic, um, mm -hmm. but I, we had a, we recorded a CD in um, the summer spring of 2019, and then it came out in September of 2020, which was sad because we couldn't then like travel around, you know, mm -hmm. playing. But we're starting to come back. We just we played a concert in Cal or in, in Florida in January. We've got. Uh, we had some in the summer, we've done some really cool house concerts. We have another one in California this, this spring. And uh, so yeah, we're roaring back up. It's exciting. We've got a bunch of new, really cool new music that we have commissioned and we, and the music's really beautiful. So yeah. Um, I think that does take us to our actual final question, sure. which is um, we have this little segment we want to do called You're Wrong which is like a two, three minute rant about something within your sphere mm -hmm. that people get wrong or people have it, uh, the incorrect perspective, perception <laughs> of, and it's your time to correct it. All right, here we go. Yep. You ready? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's flutist, not flautist. <gasps> oh, okay. my gosh. This is, this is where we begin my rant, where we, <laughs> people get it wrong. And now here's the thing, you're, you're only partially wrong if you say flautist, but if you're saying flautist because you think it's cooler sounding, it's not, it's <laughs> just British. And they might say flautist, but I don't play the flout, I play the flute. And the flute is the instrument to flout means to mock or to jeer at somebody. So I do not mock or jeer with my instrument. So that's my little mini rant. And you can make a living at, at music. <laughs> Let's just bring it back. Um, I get very frustrated with this concept of, oh, you can only be a band director or play in an orchestra. No, friends, there's so much to do out there. You can work for Spotify or Napster. You could work yeah. in um, copyright. You could work in copying, like writing music. You can move to Nashville and be a session musician. You can, oh um, my, I got pages of, of cool jobs that you can do that are really <laughs> off the beaten path. And, you know, sometimes I even look at like, you know, a, a Napster and you can scroll to the bottom of their website and you can see jobs. Well, I'll tell you, friends, those jobs require a Bachelor of Music degree. Mm -hmm. So you can live in a cool city like San Francisco and, and you have to have a Bachelor of Music degree and be able to understand tonality and form and structure and, and the, the basics of music so that you can help describe the music and put it in a playlist. So there is, there's so much to do in this career. And um, I mean, gosh, here we are writing a textbook, right? So um, that's pretty cool too. So there's my little mini rant. Sorry. I love, I love both yeah, of those rants. Too. <laughs> I did not know. I guess I didn't ever quite wonder which one it was, flutist or flautist. <laughs> I'm so glad we didn't do the intro because I was saying it out loud to myself and I definitely called you a flautist <laughs> multiple times. So thank God. <laughs> but we know now when we record the intro. You are fully informed in the world of, yeah. of music flute playing anyway well thank you so much yes. that was a lot of fun chatting today. and yeah we're looking forward to your um your revisions yeah me too and i, I will have you... good help with that by the way i can't claim that i am an expert in this so um we'll be bringing in a a contributing author to help me uh who knows a lot more about this than i do and i'm i'm honored to have someone help yeah. me so yeah, yeah. Thank you, Michelle, for joining us on Can I Get a Retake? Michaela and I enjoyed chatting with you, especially as curious adults who were musicians in our earlier years. 
There are so many possible careers and life paths in music that we just weren't aware of. We hope students interested in a lifelong music career can be inspired by this conversation with you. Your passion for the new generation of music creators is energizing, and we're sure there are educators listening who share your drive to seed music love and literacy in the hearts of today's students. Can I Get a Retake is hosted by Michelle Manneman and Michaela Albee. The show is edited by Maggie Christensen. Artwork for the podcast was designed by Michelle Manneman. Our intro and outro music was created by Coma Media. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please subscribe, share, rate, and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. To join the conversation, you can find us on Instagram at Can I Get a Retake. For show notes and episode transcripts, visit greatriverlearning.com slash podcast.